I'm Mia Parrish, and today in Devils in the Details, we're talking with Lynn Downey, my colleague at the Cronkite School, and the author of All About the Story, which is about as many years of the Washington Post and changes in media and media's role in an election year. So welcome, Lynn, and tell me a little bit about why you decided to do this book now. Well, actually, I decided some years ago, um, after I retired, I continued to have an office in the Washington Post building for a long time and sort of served as an advisor to the newsroom when they wanted me to. Uh, and uh, But then when they moved to a new, uh, a new office in a new building with a lot of high tech stuff and everything, there wasn't any more room for me. So I had to move everything to my house and in going through all my uh, files, which was which were voluminous, I realized I have a story to tell here, I think. And I contemplated it for, for several years, and I began talking to other people about it. And as I write in the book itself, when I talked to Bob Woodward about it, he pretty much ordered me to write this book, telling me that it was important. It was, I, I was editor through so much, reporter and editor, through so much American history that it, that it might be important for other people to read it. So I trusted him, and I wrote the book. You've been part of history for... 50 plus years covering it and making it. Um, tell me a little bit about your favorite story. Certainly Watergate, being one of the editors in the Watergate story was extremely important at the time. Uh, and as I talk in the book, being on the, it was a local news staff story uh, at a time when uh, national political reporters really didn't believe that this was going on, that the president could be involved in this. So that was a, that was a really very dramatic chapter. I was, I was a, a very young editor at the time. Uh, um, 9-11, the way the staff came together in 9-11, obviously a terrible tragedy for American people, but the way that the staff came together to uh, produce the journalism that day and all the days forward and the weeks and months ahead of that, ahead of that uh, was, was very gratifying to me. Uh, Bob Woodward, who writes lots of books, was working on a book and he came into the newsroom without being asked number of other of our most talented uh, writers who were working on books came in. Uh, people who were, uh, who were out, uh, out sick, what one, uh, one editor who had broken her arm just a couple days before was ordered by her doctor not to work for weeks, came in and insisted on not leaving. She was going to run her copy desk no matter what. Uh, it, it, it was just, uh, and, and we did a lot of great journalism. Uh, and so that was a very rewarding time. Uh, as, a, as a reporter, uh, I probably, um, uh, being, being one of these Americans who's fascinated by British royalty, and the fact that I was able to host uh, Prince Charles at dinner not long before the royal wedding, and then to report on the royal wedding, and then to unfortunately watch the deterioration of that marriage, first as a reporter and then as the editor and editor back at the Post, uh, was, uh, was an also, also something that was very memorable. Len, you ended up being really timely with the publication of your book, and one of my favorite, um, most interesting stories for the time that we're in is about the Florida recount. We were completely unprepared for what happened on the election night uh, in the in, in year 2000. Uh, we knew it was a close race, um, uh, but, uh, and, and, and by, um, uh, and after midnight, it was still too close to call. The networks first called it for Gore, and then they called it for Bush. And uh, we had three different possible stories to put on the front page in our final edition, one with Gore winning, one with Bush winning, and one with uh, uh, neither one winning with a, with a recount necessary. We didn't actually know about the recount at that stage, but we, that, that, that the election was not yet, uh, the winner was not yet known, was how we were working on that particular part, that particular story. And uh, our, our uh, political reporter, Dan Baltz, uh, very well, very well sourced, <clears throat> was hearing that uh, Gore was probably going to concede or was on his way to concede, I believe, at the time. He figured that probably we ought to go ahead with the, uh, with the, with, with the Bush, Bush winning lead. And actually, that was on our presses. The plates with that story were on the presses with Bush winning, and had a, a banner headline with Bush winning. And uh, um, uh, one of our political editors uh, uh, came over and said that there was doubts about this, that there were doubts in the Gore camp about whether he should go ahead and concede. Uh, and uh, so my managing editor, Steve Call, a really brilliant 
each person, my managing editor at the time, I got it, picked up a piece of paper. I don't think it was the back of an envelope, but some piece of scrap paper in the newsroom and began calculating what Gore's lead was in Florida and how, how large the, out, uh, the uncounted vote still was. And we realized that uh, the uncounted vote was larger than his lead and he could lose his lead and he could, he could still lose in Florida. And so we decided to, uh, I, I, I did something I very rarely did. I called the press room and I asked that they take all those plates off the press for the final edition and hold up the final edition and wait until we sent another story down. And the story about the, uh, the, the, the the election being undecided and that there'd have to be a recount in Florida was the one that we put on the front page. What are some of the positive changes you've seen in journalism over the decades? Um, and what sort of challenges do you see for us? I think it's really important that the news media for the, for the remaining days before the election, the 40 some days before the election, cover voting, every aspect of voting as much as they cover the campaign, uh, because we now know from 2000 what can happen. And we also know there will be more mail-in ballots than ever before. We know that some states aren't necessarily prepared for that. We know about the president saying that the mail-in ballots are not going to be, are going to be fraudulent. All kinds of issues involved. And we also know that there are questions about access to voting in many states uh, for, all, for all voters. Uh, and uh, and how, how, how the votes are going to be counted in the end and, and how many polling places are going to be open and how healthy it's going to be to go to your polling place to vote, what, how they're going to manage the lines, et cetera. There's so many issues involved in that. And I think that's a very, very important story for the media, news media now. And if you were the editor, executive editor of the Washington Post right now, what would be your prime directive on that? Uh, to do to do what I said, and they are doing what what, what, what I've been saying. I, I can I can watch that they are they have made this a, a a an important part of their coverage, uh, and that I think it should continue. How how do you think politics um, the coverage of politics has changed over the years? You know, back back when uh, until the internet came along. Uh, coverage of politics was essentially dictated by, by large news organizations uh, like the New York Times and the Washington Post uh, and, and the big net and the broadcast networks. Now we have this cacophony of websites and, uh, and, um, um, and um, cable channels and, c- and cable networks uh, with uh, uh, many, many of which had points of view. Uh, and are not presenting just the facts, but are presenting their opinions along with facts and sometimes uh, falsehoods along with the facts and, and opinions. And so I think that's very confusing for the American voter to know exactly factually what's going on, what each candidate represents, not just nationally, but locally, uh, and, uh, uh, and whether or not they're being manipulated by false information uh, coming to them through social media, through cable networks. Uh, Etc. We have this um, a really exciting time for student journalists and helping change and um, and help them with the credibility going forward. What are you telling them, and and what do you think is most important for them? Uh, one thing that I tell them, which is controversial now, and, and and people raise questions about now, is to be careful about what they say in social media. To, uh, to reveal biases. But first of all, I would prefer that they not have biases. Uh, I, I, I was famous for, for not voting. Right. The time that I became managing editor of the Post in 1984 uh, uh, to, uh, to when I, I, I retired as executive editor in 2008. That's a quarter century that I did not vote because I was the final gatekeeper. But Ben, ben Bradley put the reins in my hands and I was the... I made the final decisions about everything that appeared in the Washington Post, and I did not want to have a bias about who should be president or mayor uh, or, or, or how issues should be handled by politicians, and so I stopped voting. I, we did not insist on that for our staff, but we did insist that members of our staff not engage in any political activity, not contribute to candidates, not put signs in their lawns, uh, not, 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 in, not march in demonstrations, not sign petitions, etc. Uh, and that was required of everybody on the staff. Uh, that was before social media came along. Now, social media has this, the temptation uh, to not just to broadcast to everybody through Twitter saying what your opinions are, but even to express them to friends and neighbors and uh, relatives who might then post them someplace else. And so I warn students that this is creating your permanent record. 
that uh, 20 years from now, if you're covering an election or covering something else in which there are ideological differences, and people can go back and find that you expressed opinions about that, they're going to raise questions about bias in your coverage. And I think they should avoid that. Now, for younger people now, they're so used to social media and they're so used to expressing opinions in social media that, for instance, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the whole questions about racial justice that are going on right now have raised questions in journalism circles and indeed in the Cronkite Journalism School about whether or not uh, student journalists should be able to post things on social media about their views, say, on racial justice. And so that raises interesting questions uh, uh, that, uh, that we're grappling with now at the Cronkite School and, and will have to be grappled with in the future and dealing with, uh, with students. Yeah, absolutely. What other challenges are you seeing journalists um, facing in this divisive time? Obviously, coping with what happens to them on social media, the attacks mm -hmm. on journalists for perfectly good reporting uh, and the threats and so on is, is something that we did not experience. Uh, you know, the Nixon administration had a lot of nasty things to say about the Washington Post and about Ben Bradley, but Bob Woodward, Carl Bernstein, myself, other editors working on the story did not experience those kinds of uh, you know, personal threats, personal attacks that are now fairly routine now for reporters who are doing brave reporting. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's, that's concerning. And the other thing, of course, is just uh, jobs. Uh, the media has been turned upside down by the internet in terms of economic uh, economics of news. Uh, many small newspapers have shrunk, many local newspapers have shrunk greatly around the country. Uh, new kinds of local media are cropping up as a result. Nonprofits still with relatively small staffs, but uh, it's, it's different than it was before. Len, tell me just a little bit about your book. Yeah, the book is about my entire career in journalism, and I was just fortunate to be often in the right place at the right time, beginning as a local investigative reporter uh, who created a lot of change in, in courts uh, in Washington as a result of my investigations, uh, to be one of the editors on Watergate because I happened to be the deputy editor on the local news staff, uh, to being a foreign correspondent in London with the rise of Margaret Thatcher and the, and the, uh, the royal wedding and, and uh, all, all of that, to cover Northern Ireland at the, uh, at the height of the troubles there, the hunger strike uh, by... Uh, uh, by uh, Irish Catholic activists uh, to, uh, to then being, to being managing editor and executive editor of the Post through a lot of history, uh, um, making, making stories. Um, but the thing I really recommend, recommend the book to people for is to see how journalism is actually done. I provide the details of what it's actually done, uh, taking you inside the newsroom, inside the story, as, as, the, uh, as the, the title implies. So you can see that we are not activists, uh, we we're not biased, uh, and, and, the, and the detailed work that's involved in trying to get the truth out to people. And I think that's a valuable insight at a time when people are questioning the media, questioning how the media does its work, questioning the media's uh, uh, ideologies and so on, to see how a, a prominent newspaper actually works from the inside. Thank you, Pulitzer Prize winner Len Downey and professor at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, talking about all about the story um, and your many years leading the Washington Post um, and what's ahead for journalism. So thank you so much for joining me today, Len. Thank you.